Hello everyone and welcome back to The Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and we're back with another lore video. A rather large one, in fact. Before we begin, I just wanted to state that the Bretonian language and names are very much based on our real French language. So I do apologize in advance for any butchering of mispronunciations that I may be doing in this video. With that being said, thank you so much for listening and I do hope you enjoy this video. Ah, Bretonia. Land of chivalrous knights, majestic horses, beautiful fields, and strong castles. Truly, this is a country of wonder, where many tales are told, and the days are happy and filled with laughter. Unless you form part of the local peasantry, of course. But let us not get too ahead of ourselves. Bretonia's history is old, almost as old as that of the Empire, full of pride glory and vanity. So let us explore it. The lands that would eventually be known as Bretonia has seen much prior to its founding as a kingdom. Long ago, when the Old Ones arrived, they bent and shaped the land to better suit their great plan. Not much is known if any races or species native to the area survived or were enhanced by the Old Ones, for history back then was not recorded. What is known is that the mountains to the east were settled by the Dawi, the Dwarves, and many of the coastal regions were settled by the High Elves after the first Chaos Incursions. Many High Elven city ruins would later be found around this nation after the famous War of the Beard, which saw the local Dwarves and the High Elf armies clashing in a brutal and bloody war. Other cities would find themselves abandoned as Ulfwan was invaded by the Dark Elves with the now broken High Elf colonies not wishing to return to their homeland. They broke ties with their kin, travelling into the lands now known as Athaloran, eventually becoming known as the Wood Elves. The land once again found itself abandoned by any strong rulers, but not for long. For around 1,500 years before the coming of Sigmar, some new life started to arrive. Humans had always been plenty across the Warhammer world at this time, Primitive as they were, many of them wished for lands of their own. Many nomadic tribes would travel as far as they could to find lands best suited for their needs. It was around this time where some of the said tribes arrived. They were not warlike, nor knew nothing of metalwork, but rather were expert farmers who lived off the land. They worshipped an ancient god known as Rhea, the mother of earth. In their new land, they built great stone circles in her honor, hoping for boons from her. For around 500 years, these nomads settled and tended to the land as if it was always theirs. Truly, this was a paradise to behold. Crops grew, the days were sunny and blessed, and naturally, with nothing threatening it, it was peaceful. Sadly, things would not stay this way for too long. A thousand years before the coming of Sigmar, a second wave of humans traveled to this paradise. Tens of thousands of humans came running from a green threat that had come from the east. They were expert horsemen and fierce warriors, but they were no match for the massive hordes that fell upon them. Seeing no other option than to stand and fight, they dug themselves in and fought the greenskins which had traveled to this lush land and eventually repelled them. Soon enough, these refugees from a far-off land also began to fight the local druid inhabitants for a place in the world. This tribe called themselves the Bretoni, a name they gave to the land itself after they had displaced the druids and the greenskins. This land was now their home, and they would defend it against invaders and pretenders. The fields here were lush and green, perfect for their grazing horses, which were as much Bretoni as they were. Horse and rider had a bond of kindred spirit. For many years they defended their lands, unwilling to compromise or move. And why should they? This land was theirs by right, and they would not bow down to any who wished them harm, or any pretenders who rose up in the future. This would be tested years later with the rise of Sigmar Heldenhammer who had now come to the various Bretoni tribes with an offer to unite, for Sigmar wished for humanity to stand together, as they were all indeed distant cousins, 
and Sigma believed that humanity should stand together as a whole. The Bretoni did not take too kindly to this man's offer. They did not wish to serve under a man whose culture was so vastly different from their own. The so-called Empire, as Sigma named it, would be left to fend for itself, and the Bretoni, as fractured as they were, would stand by themselves. They would neither need the help from the Empire, nor ask for it. As time passed, and thankfully being relatively close to the Dwarfs of the Grey Mountains, the Bretoni had started to learn the arts of masonry and metalworks. Without long, many of the tribes were building cities and castles, very much reminiscent of the Bretonian cities that we know of today. As the years passed, the Bretoni advanced as a people, shifting aside their more tribal nature to that of a more feudal one and taking on many new customs. One such custom is where the strongest and bravest man in the village would be chosen as the village's protector. All in the village would work to provide this young man and his warhorse the very best of their supplies. He would not have to work the fields, but rather train and practice each day, making him far stronger than the local populace. In exchange for this warrior's protection, they would feed him with the best food and drink they could find, arm him with the best weapons, clothe him in only the finest of wares, and the protector may marry the fairest maiden in the village. Naturally, being such a warrior of prestige would demand a home of prestige too. Originally, the town would home said warrior in the local watchtower, so that the warrior may be able to have a protective view of the town. In the coming years, as the Bretoni learnt more and more about masonry, the towers would eventually be replaced with mighty castles, some of which still stand to this day. These warriors would stand tall as they watched over their village. Any who would challenge them or hope to bring harm to this warrior would be met with sword and fury. These warriors became known as knights, and while there were knights in other human tribes across the world, it is said that none can match the knights of the Bretoni tribes, with the Bretoni outright stating that the art of knighthood was indeed perfected by them. As the villagers expanded, many of the self-made kings and warlords also too saw a new sense of purpose within these lands. They renamed themselves to dukes as their lands expanded, and soon enough there were 16 dukedoms within the lands of Bretonia, two more than the dukedoms that we know of today. Within these prosperous times there were still many threats. The Greenskins had populated areas within the dukedoms, growing to large extents at some point, but being quelled before they became too much of a problem. Herds of beastmen would also prove to be quite problematic, however they were rabble compared to the skill of the local knights, and the occasional necromancer may prove to be a hassle, but once again they would be sent on their way or killed before they could do any long term damage. That was until an orc warboss named Gragabad had risen through the ranks, eventually amassing a rather large greenskin horde, and invaded the dukedom of Kyulu. The lands were overrun and many were slaughtered. The knights of the dukedom attempted to repel the invaders. Unfortunately for them, it would seem that no aid would come to the ancient dukedom. Soon enough, Kyulu was destroyed, the lands ravaged and its populace killed under the rage of the greenskin horde. The neighboring dukedoms of Gwynel and Brion merely stood watch as their king were put to the blade. That being said, they were all too aware of the hordes rampaging near them, and stood to gain from this. The greenskins at this time were too strong, but after the fighting was done, the orcs would be weaker, and there would be many new lands to claim. And it was so that both dukes led their armies to break the greenskin lines. The weakened orcs and goblins were no match against the two dukedoms, and they shattered before much fighting could even begin. Both dukes stood over the ruins of Gyolu, both wanting to annex the lands for themselves, but none of them wished to pin each army against each other, as the orcs had merely shattered and would eventually be back in full force. Because of this, the dukes had decided in an honourable method to decide 
who would now keep the vacant lands? A duel. The Duke of Brion and the Duke of Cunel fought in bloody combat, but alas, the Duke of Brion fell, and Cunel's was expanded, while the Dukedom of Gyulu was forgotten in history. All was calm for a few short years. A new duke rose in Brion, and even slew the mighty Gragabad, and shattered the Greenskin side once again. You'd think that this event would bring an era of peace throughout the land, but you would be wrong. Orcs fondly remember those who brought up a good fight, and eventually returned, but now the Orcs were but one of many problems. From the frozen lands of Norska came many raiders, hell-bent on destroying, pillaging and sacrificing. From the forest came many herds of beastmen, destroying all in their path, in the name of the Dark Gods. Attacked on all fronts, many of the dukes commanded their people stay within their castle walls. Those who were caught outside would surely die. The dukes and knights would defend their homes with the fear of being forgotten with time. Even with all their enemies currently within their land, the knights stood strong. That is, until more arrived, for the now undead armies of Cetra the Imperishable had travelled from the far south in a quest for conquest. The Bretoni had braced themselves, as they were being invaded from all sides by so many enemies. Hope was dwindling, but still they fought on, even as the dukedom of Glanbriel was shattered and destroyed. In the midst of these dark times, one ancient duke was still hopeful and determined to repel the invaders. Gilles Le Breton, Duke of Bastogne, was a proud warrior. He who slew a dragon in single combat, whose voice could command even the most cowardly of warriors into a rage-induced fury. Gilles gathered to him Ferof de Leonesse and Landuin de Musillon, his closest and dearest friend to his banner, and led their combined armies to free the lands of these invaders. The combined armies fought as hard as they could, but sadly, it barely made a dent in the enemy forces. They found themselves exhausted after constant days of fighting, and the fighting would not see an end. Tired and spent, the Bretoni armies encamped themselves at a nearby lake, in hopes to recover their strength for the coming battle in the morrow ahead. The Greenskins didn't allow them to sleep much. Naturally, they wanted the humans to be tired and thus beat their war drums loudly into the night. Such are cheap greenskin tactics. The Bretoni feared for the worst, but some glimmer of hope still stayed with Gills. Gills was not one to show his darkest fears, but the fears were still there. Before the battle had begun, he knelt at the lake's waters to take a drink and pray for strength, for not just him, but his people as a whole. These waters were miscovered and radiated with beauty, and from these mists rose their saving grace. A beautiful woman, none which has ever been seen before, radiating with kindness and a smile that could warm the coldest of hearts. As can be expected, the Bretoni were afraid, all but Gills, who felt nothing but her presence around him. With nothing to lose, he rose and asked, Lady, wouldst thou bless mine banner? before dipping the bloody and ruined banner of Bastogne into the lake. As the banner was taken out of the water, it was now repaired, with the symbol of a golden grail added to it. It was then that the other knights stood at the foot of the lake. Each of them would ask for this mysterious lady to bless their banners, swords, lances and more. One by one, the lady blessed the knight's armaments and a wave of strength rushed through them. Before they would bid adieu to the lady, she held up a magical chalice, and only allowed Gyrus and his two fellow dukes to drink from it. As they did, they were empowered by the waters within, and thus became the first of the famously known Grail Companions. The dukes and the Bretoni had been empowered by this mysterious lady, and with their newfound strength, they turned their attention to the hordes that threatened these lands. The Greenskins, no matter how much they outnumbered the Bretoni, were no match for the knights who were empowered by the mysterious Lady of the Lake. One by one, 
the waves of orcs and goblins would be shattered and forced to retreat. It was not long until all of them were making their way back to the mountains. The knights on the other hand did not pursue for long, for as the sun began to set, they journeyed back to the sacred lake, leaving the fleeing greenskins to deal with the terrors in the mountains. They gathered at the great lake, resting for a moment as many a dead greenskin lay dead and beginning to rot. There the dukes and knights made a vow, from henceforth they would serve the mysterious Lady of the Lake. She was their saviour and their goddess. They also vowed that together they would free Bretonia from the horrors that laid waste to her. By the Lady this was their oath, and an oath they would keep. Over the years, the Grail companions led by Gilles Le Breton would travel across the land, shattering any who stood against them and freeing the lands that had so long been under siege. Bordelot and Anquitaine were next to be freed, with the Lady of the Lake also appearing to their respective dukes, allowing them to drink from the Grail and also joining the ranks of the Grail companions. It is said that Marcus de Bordelot was so taken by the Lady's beauty that he erected the very first Grail Chapel. Next, the Dukedom of Brion was under attack by a large horde of orcs, but by now the Bretonis' armies had swelled in massive numbers. They charged the orcs from the rear as the Bretoni from Brion charged from inside the castle. Once again the Lady appeared, and the Duke of Brion, Baldwin, was allowed to drink from the Grail and become another Grail companion. Next, the Lady appeared to the Bretonian armies, urging them to head to the Dukedom of Gunerves as it was in grave danger. They rode through Carcassonne, where the Duke and his armies were all too willing to join in this crusade. Thousands of orcs had laid waste to the Dukedom of Gunerves, with the Forest of Loren next to it being set alight. Here, Gilles Le Breton made a powerful ally with the Fey Enchantress. A woman of great power, which many of the Bretoni feared to be a witch. But in reality, she would prove to be an asset, and loyal to all of which Bretonia stood for. Soon enough, after the Greenskins were repelled, Lambard de Carcassonne and Radamund the Pure were presented to the Lady and allowed to drink from the Grail, thus joining the ranks of the Grail Companions. Their journeys took them north to the Dukedom of Paravon, which sadly lay in ruins, yet their Duke, Lord Agilgar, stood strong fighting the invaders, and he would have fallen were it not for the massive empowered army behind Gilles Le Breton. Soon enough, Lord Agilgar and his remnants joined with Gilles' armies. Next they journeyed to Montfort, where a massive horde of greenskins readied for their assault but found themselves distracted by the now arriving horsemen. A distraction that proved fatal as the Grail companions charged and broke the greenskin lines. It was here that Bretonia almost suffered their greatest defeat, for Gilles de Breton was struck down by a goblin ballista. He would have died were it not for the intervention of the Lady of the Lake, who once again appeared in Bretonia's hour of need. Gilles was healed by their loving goddess, and for their dedication to their land, the Dukes of Paravon and Montfort were allowed to drink from the Grail, and allowed to join the Grail Companions. With Gilles now healed, he led his combined armies into a mighty charge towards the retreating Greenskins. These beasts had no right to be in Bretonia, and by the light of the Lady they would be expelled. Ten Companions now stood tall. Many dukedoms had been saved but there were still many threats to Bretonia, and they could not rest until all of Bretonia was safe. The Dukedom of Gisoro had been caught under a magical maelstrom of orcish shamanistic magic, but the Lady was kind to her followers and protected them from Gork and Mork's destructive powers, once again shattering the orcish lines. Next, they marched to Musilon, which had been beset by two foes, an army of undead and the chaotic beastmen. Poor Musilon, as we now know, it is a dukedom of horrors, but it was once the most beautiful of all Bretonia. It had been put to flame and ruin, and now must be freed. No matter the horrors that lay waste to Bretonia, 
the Grail companions and their armies would stand strong. Thankfully, many defenders still yet lived. Those of Folgar d'Artois had rushed to the aid of Musilon before the Grail companions and were defending the inner city as those blessed by the lady arrived to save them. With a strong heart and trusty steed, the Knights of Bretonia rode out together to meet the enemies of Bretonia. Many long dead who have risen again and mutants in servitude of the ruinous powers. Even with the odds vastly against them, the servants of the lady would once again not falter, for faith is a powerful thing, and with faith their enemies would be struck down. The undead returned to the grave, and the beastmen now fled. Wishing to see an end to this threat, the dukes Beren and Forgar gave chase to them, and when they later returned, they radiated with the glow of the lady and joined their fellow dukes as grail companions. With the dead gone, the beastmen and the greenskins currently retreating, if not momentarily, the Bretoni turned their attentions to the Norskin raiders who had been ravaging the coastal regions to its core. In the dukedom of Leanguil stood the chieftain of these foul warriors of the north. One thing can be stated here, the men of Norska are bloody and tend to worship the Chaos Gods, but they are not without honour. A very rare occurrence in the Warhammer world. The Duke of Languil knew of this well enough, and challenged the Norskin chieftain, Svengar, to single combat. The conditions were simple, the loser's forces would withdraw from the battlefield. Svengar would not turn down this opportunity to prove his might. Both warriors were hardened veterans, and the battle would last on for over a day. But in the end, it is the duke whose faith kept him fighting being the victor. Svengar lay dead, and as promised, lest they forsake their honour, the warriors from the frozen north left. Many threats had been quelled, yet still many more existed. The Grail Knights were empowered, yes, but the other knights and the rest of the armies were not, and thus they were allowed a night's rest. On the morrow they would ride to the dukedom of Kurong. En route they would meet with the Duke of Kurong, where together they would slay a horde of greenskins before continuing their journey. All was fine, or at least seemed to be within the city of the dukedom. The armies would travel in and be greeted with a sight which they had not seen for quite some time. Normality. Not that this would last for long, however, as word had reached them that a herd of beastmen were charging out of the forest of Arden. Naturally, the warriors of Bretonia rose to destroy these chaos-infused invaders, and the greenskins, which had now once again began to pour out into the fields nearby. But as they began their ride, a new enemy had joined the fray, for the Skaven were lying in wait under the city as Skaven do, and began to pillage and destroy all that they could. Three armies stood against them. They were vastly outnumbered, but still they stood strong. The Lady of the Lake herself once again appeared before her followers. Here she allowed the Dukes of Languil and Guron to drink from the Holy Grail, and become the final of the Grail Companions. Then she blessed the united armies of Bretonia to fight in her name and purge the filth from hers and their land. For weeks the people of Bretonia fought against three different armies, but with the blessing of their lady they will not fail. Day in and day out, the warriors of Bretonia fought with strength that would never waver. Skaven, Beastmen and Greenskin would fall in the hundreds over and over again. Soon enough their adversaries would break and flee. The Greenskins ran to the mountains, the Beastmen to the forests, and the Skaven back into the underground warrens from which they came. The Bretoni were finally safe from the invaders, and now they looked towards a new day. With the lands now secure, the Grail Companions, who have built a strong bond together after the many battles to free the land of all the terrors, realized that the Bretoni were stronger together than apart. Bretonia had suffered much over the years, but they knew that under the leadership of Gears Le Breton, first chosen of the Lady of the Lake, they would prosper more than any other nation. Gilles Le Breton became the first Royarch, King of Bretonia. 
Together, the first king and his grail companions would protect the land, all in the name of the Lady of the Lake. While many would still attempt to attack Bretonia, none could hold out against the might of the servants of the Lady. Bretonia's defenders were strong of heart, but sadly not immortal, not even the king himself. While dispatching a greenskin horde, the great king was taken down by a cowardly orc. Seeing his last moments ahead of him, Gils demanded to be placed on a small boat in a nearby lake so he may be with his goddess. From this, a legend was spawned. In Bretonia's darkest hour, Gils would return to fight alongside his people once again. Bretonia was left without a king and a duke to Bastogne. A successor was found right away for the dukedom. Naturally, many looked towards the former king's son, Luis, as the new Duke of Bastogne. But many had questioned if he had the right to also be crowned king. Surely, the son of the kingdom's founder would also be a great king. But many argued against him. Some of the other dukes stood for their claim to the throne, stating that they would be far better leaders and carry on the vision that Gyrus had for Bretonia. The dukes would argue, but eventually realized that most, if not all, had wished to claim the throne. The constant arguing was not doing Bretonia any good, for the longer they argued, the longer Bretonia was without a king. And since the majority of them felt Luis was the best option to become king, they began to agree. This once again only gave reason for the dukes to argue. Luis was the son of Gilles Le Breton, first king of Bretonia, yes. But he had yet not sipped from the Holy Grail, and was thus not chosen by the lady. If Luis wanted to be king, he would have to go about a quest to seek the lady's blessing. As a law was set in place that only those and those alone who had received the blessing of the lady could rule in Bretonia in any way, shape or form. This led to the creation of the famed tradition known as the Questing Knights. And so it was that Luis rode off to seek the blessings. For years Luis travelled, righting many wrongs and performing many heroic deeds, all in the name of the Lady of the Lake. While he was gone, another duke acted as Bretonia's steward, while the young knight was away in his travels. Luis would return a number of years later, glowing with a radiance seen by only those blessed by the Lady of the Lake. And so it was that the young duke sat upon his throne, while his servants all bowed to the true king of Bretonia. Luis was crowned as Bretonia was once again home, and a celebration was held throughout the land. As the newly crowned king, Luis went straight to work. His first order was to formalize the rights of the Questing Knights, the very same he had undertaken as a tradition throughout Bretonia. Many knights casted aside their former lives as lords of land in order to pursue these rights. The faith in older gods was gradually lost as Bretonia found itself devoting itself fully to the Lady of the Lake. Many knights now found themselves patrolling the borders of Bretonia and many possible threats would be eliminated before any damage could be done. Luis was wise beyond his years. Much like his father, he saw the bigger picture of things, and thus sought an alliance of sorts with the local wood elves. The terms were simple. No man of Bretonia should enter Athaloran, and in return, both Bretonia and Athaloran would defend each other should it be needed. For the next few hundred years, Bretonia would see an age of chivalry. The king would eventually pass, as time was a cruel cool mistress, and others would rise to take the mantle. Any new king would have to take the rite of passage that is the questing knight. The cities within the dukedoms would grow. Many chapels in the name of the lady would be built. Any who once again sought harm to Bretonia would be destroyed, be it Greenskin, Tomb King or otherwise. The Knights of Bretonia would not only come to the aid of the Wood Elves, however, for where there was need, they would go. This was proven when a massive invasion force from the country of Araby 
had landed within the lands of the free peoples of Estalia and laid waste to them. The people of Estalia sent many envoys hoping for aid, and Bretonia answered without question. Together with the forces of the Empire, the combined armies rode down with haste to Estalia before it was too late. This was the era known as the Great Crusade, where many nations of various creeds joined together to repel the invaders from the south. The forces of Araby would be pushed out of Estalia, with the free people being liberated. But this was not the end, for if they had managed to do this once, thankfully while Bretonia was not occupied with any wars of their own, who's to say they would not attempt this again? Now further reinforced by Estalian and Talian warships, who too wished for revenge, the army set sail to the lands of Araby. Jafar, the Sultan of Araby, and his armies readied themselves, for a mighty host was coming to see his undoing. Despite the harsh conditions of the desert lands, the united armies marched through, and Araby found itself under siege. As more and more cities of Araby fell before the might of the Crusaders, its people began to lose faith in their Sultan, with many eventually leaving him to his own doing. Jafar saw his end when he faced the might of both Bretonian and Imperial knights fighting together. He lay dead, and his army shattered and broken. The Bretonians celebrated with their allies, before looting what they could and returning home, for the desert was no place for a knight, and they would be needed back home in the land of splendor and chivalry. Some knights, however, did stay within the area, and some traveled to far-off regions, eventually settling there. These new lands would eventually be known as the Border Princes, but this is a topic for another day. Once again, for years, Bretonia enjoyed peace. At all their borders, they had allies, and despite the occasional invasion, they would not suffer for long. It was until the Red Pox. The Red Pox was a terrifying disease set upon the lands of Bretonia by the Skaven of Skavenblight. Many died, and the population of this great nation was decimated. Seeing no other option than to watch the healthy become infected, many ordered for the sick to be put to death. An extreme measure, yes, but this was the only way to stop the spreading of the disease. Soon enough, nearly a third of Bretonia's populace was destroyed, and Bretonia was almost decimated. Its people tried to make the best of the situation, the knights attempted to keep the peace, but it was no use, for more and more people were dying, and when it eventually seemed that the worst had happened and they could finally look onto rebuilding, the Skaven burst forth from the sewers. Hundreds of thousands of ratmen charged forth, and soon enough, Bretonia found itself in an all-out war. The Dukes of Bretonia rode out with their armies to meet the hordes of rats, and thankfully, much to everyone's surprise, the Wood Elves of Atheloran honored their ancient agreement and aided the Horse Lords, despite the fact they were only really doing it out of their own interest. Time and time again, the rats would be repelled. Many owed their lives to the Duke of Musilon, Lord Merovech, whom, with his pure might and ferocious warriors, lifted many sieges and shattered many Skaven lines. Within this madness, the Duke of Musilon had been undergoing some changes that were still not yet clear. In his rage, he proclaimed himself to be the saviour of Bretonia, and in truth, time and time again, he did protect the lands. Many of the common folk hailed him as a hero, but dark deeds were happening in Musilon. The once jewel of Bretonia was withering, much as its people did. The Skaven would eventually be repelled, and Bretonia would celebrate, with the Dukes of the land being invited to the home of their saviour. Missilon had changed over the years, and the Dukes had noticed it. It was difficult to tell what damage had been done by its own people, or the damage that had been done by the Skaven. Many shambling horrors now walked the streets, much to the horror of those of the other dukedoms. Merovech, on the other hand, did not understand their fears, for to him, this was his home, 
his people, and they were being disrespected. No more would he allow the king and his dukes to insult Musilon. It was changed, yes, but it was still a duel, and such insults would only lead to death within these lands. Hoping to put an end to this madness, the current king of Bretonia challenged this mad duke to a duel, but unfortunately, Medovec fought in a blood-crazed frenzy, ripping out his throat and pouring the blood into a chalice for him to drink. The dukes were terrified, and with good reason, and were faced with no other alternative than to flee, with many former knights of Musilon joining them after being shown the true horrors that lay within their former home. Menovec would eventually be slain by the combined forces of all the dukedoms, but Musilon forever suffers his taint, as a dark shadow looms over the land, and the dukedom of Musilon was forever lost. Bretonia quickly rebuilt from the devastation of the recent wars, and once again was seen as a shining light in a dark and bloody world. On many occasions, its armies would venture forth on crusades that would eventually be known as Errantries. These armies would travel far and wide, some to the lands of Araby to quell any growing armies, some to the lands of the border princes to lend aid to the natives of the regions against the hordes of rampaging greenskins. Wherever they roamed, the knights of Bretonia instilled fear upon their enemies, for there were no greater warriors nor horse riders than they, and all were rabble against the chivalrous nobles. Bretonia has seen many dark days, yet they still stand, for these are the men of the Lady of the Lake, and with her blessings they will not falter. Any who come to Bretonia with ill intentions will be met by sword and lance. Such is the will of the Lady, and the Lady's will is law. And with that, my friends, we've come to the end of our law video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, might I suggest giving the video a like, or even subscribing to the channel, as it really does help us out. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and I shall see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day.